السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We're on the sixth day of Muharram and with Dr. Waldry we are having a discussion on the lessons that we learned from the sacrifice of Imam Hussain and the battlefield of Karbala We're faced with the odds of losing his and his family's life he stood up the grounds and challenged the powers and the mights of that particular time even though they all claimed to be muslims yet it was a battle that has gone down in history as a game changer uh, for islam uh, because from that time onward uh, the shape of islam was changed by those tyrants to suit their political interest which was later on endorsed or supported or promoted by many many dynasties in different parts of the world imagine if that event may not have taken place what would have been the situation in the case of the muslim community and muslim society one of the key concept uh, that imam sense struggle uh, is remembered 1400 years after he went is his commitment to the concept of equality which of course became a constitutional and legal uh, kind of um, terminology after all those kind of charters that we developed in 1940s and much before that you know in, in different forms of uh, documents that in different societies adopted i think uh, at that time when there was no such kind of chart and there was no such kind of uh, talk about the equality of human being when 90 percent of the people lived in a state of slavery where the people were being treated as objects where men and women both suffered at the hands of those people who were uh, mighty powerful uh, they, they stood up for the idea of uh, 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 equality uh, in 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 terms of uh, uh, not only uh, uh, being equal in status in rights and opportunities that means that he wanted each an individual and group of people given the same resources and opportunities regardless of the circumstances in the society and racial or ethnic movements now this is uh, something that is hard to find in those kind of errors in those kind of people we are basically if you look at these societies at that particular time the same day in a time when imam Hussein was having that kind of struggle uh, china was having uh, the worst kind of slavery India was having worst kind of oppression against Dalits who were being condemned to lower status based on their birth because uh, they were told that they were born from the feet of of, uh, of uh, the deity. Or even in Europe also, you find the same kind of thing. And in, 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 in South America, the situation was also uh, almost like the same where the masters would control all those things and you know the colonial period came and it basically treated the indigenous people the same way as uh, as uh, was uh, being treated by by many others in the past also and uh, uh, the worst thing is that uh, they even though in the colonial period they talked about the equality they talked about equality in terms of language in terms of uh, what they should study, the dress, all, all those kind of things. Imam Hussein was not about those kind of things that they people should have one language or one dress or one. He was concerned about the, the the status and dignity of the human being, that human being should have right to live as a decent human being, should have right to family, should have right to acquire knowledge, should have right to basically exercise restraint, should have right to uh, basically choose their own path and their own way it is in that sense 
he he probably unconsciously made a distinction between equality and equity. Now, equity recognizes that each person has varying circumstances and needs. And therefore, different groups of people need resources and opportunities allocated to them according in order to thrive. That is what equity. Now, equality is giving everyone the exact same resource across the board. So he made that kind of distinction when based on the needs of the people, based on the groups uh, of the groups also. He uh, was talking of a society where the resources would be allocated on the basis of opportunities and on the basis of the needs for people to thrive. So uh, this is something that, of course, we came to recognize much later, e even in this country, where uh, um, you know NCAs uh, worked on those kind of lines, and still we we have still uh, the, the 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 problems. I think uh, both equality and equity has to be looked at from that kind of perspective. And it is in this uh, context we look at the issue of equality and we hope that uh, when we talk about this equality, we make a distinction between equity and equality. And uh, the vision, I may have got it wrong, but uh, Dr. Walji would correct me. No, I'm saying, as I understand, it's more for equity where people according to the needs and to their status and to their position in the society at that particular moment would be allocated resources and opportunities to improve their life situations and to move forward, whether it is ethical, whether it is economic, whether it is political, cultural, and all those things. Uh, back to you, Dr. Uh, Walsh. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aslam. Bismillah rahman rahim uh, I think a fine distinction between equity and equality that you enunciated, you know, requires a lot of reflection on our part. And truly, I mean, it was all about, you know, equity also in, in, in Karbala. Uh, at the same time, the equality that was to be um, ingrained uh, within the various people who joined uh, him from different places, also suggested a level of equality there. Uh, well, allow me to, to in fact, quote uh, the, the Blessed Prophet Islam, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that, and, and this is truly the golden rule that defines the entire issue of, 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 uh, of equality as well as equity, because it encompasses uh, both. When he said, none of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother, what he wishes for himself. You know, this profound message, which generates empathy and compassion, resonates deeply with the essence of equity. The golden rule calls us to treat others as we wish to be treated ourselves. When you look at this, the, the entire uh, concept of the golden rule, and the golden rule exists in almost every faith that one, one can come across, the idea of the equality uh, within the, the, the human system. So I'd like to uh, take this moment, the few moments that we have, to travel back to the uh, sense of Karbala, where a diverse gathering of souls had emerged. There were Arabs from various tribes and known Arab companions and individuals from different faiths. As we talked earlier um, yesterday, that these people had come for a common cause. They were all united by a shared vision. And to them, Imam Hussain was a beacon of righteousness. And he was also here to shatter the chains of division, proving that Islam knows no specific orders, no prejudices. Example is, you know, Habib ibn Mazahir or Muslim ibn Awsaja that we talked about. The valiant known Arab followers like the Ethiopian John 
they united in the battlefield in their quest for justice that we talked a few days ago and equality that we are talking about today. They all stood as a testimony to the power of unity, echoing the call for brotherhood and mutual respect that echoed in the hearts of all those, you know, who felt this message of us. I mean, it's, it's talking about equality and talk about status and the lack of status. In the midst of this extraordinary uh, assemblage that we had, we find the embodiment of humanity's finest quality. Abu Thamama, a former slave, fought side by side with his fellow free men, affirming, affirming the soul of every, worth of every soul, irrespective of social status. There was uh, the touching tale of just newly married Wahab al Kalbi, a man of a Christian, a man of different faith, drawn by that magnetic force of justice and equality. And it shows that his presence illuminated the spirit of inclusivity. We are talking about equality here. This was the spirit of inclusivity. So Imam Hussein embraced proving that the call for righteousness transcends all different boundaries. And I'd like to thank one of my friends, Ali Abbas Qureshi, who drew my attention just yesterday on the concept of the, the kind of tribes who were there. And I'd like to share this list with you that he shared with me, that yes, there were 26 amongst the companions of Imam Hussein from the progeny of Abu Talib, the family of what we may call the Ahlul Bayt. But there were also 13 people from the tribe of Hamadan, uh, eight people from the uh, you know, Arab tribe of Madhaj. There were seven Ansar, seven from the uh, Banu Asad, the tribe of Asli at six, the Taimi tribe, the Kinda tribe, the Tagli tribe, and other helpers like the Juhani, the Kalbi, the Gavhari, the Tai and the Tamil. All these were part and parcel of this group. So it was not just about one clan as sometimes it is presumed that this was, you know, a clan that Hussein had brought with him. This was a diverse group of warriors on the battlefield. At the same time, we talked about this a couple of nights ago, that there were women. The women who were the strength of the menfolk who were there waiting in the wings. And of course, the embodiment of strength, resilience, and unwavering dedication to the cause where all these women led by Zainab, the daughter of Ali, and they demonstrated their valor, nursing the wounded, offering solace, receiving the dead bodies of, of, of brothers, sons, and husbands, and all that, and with, with valor, with courage. And also Zainab's courage that we talked about a few nights ago, in terms of the eloquence in the face of adversity. All these are part and parcel of be it gender equality, be it race equality, whatever it may be, Imam Hussein's army at Karbala became a living testament to this notion of equality. It was a tapestry that was woven from the threads of diversity and forming really a radiant example and a vision for an equitable world. But, you know, we cannot just confine this to the tales of history. There are lessons that can be lived within our lives today. Equality is not a mere concept to be discussed in hell or holes or in these Zoom sessions. They are values that enrich societies. They foster understanding and they promote harmony. I'm just going to go through a few basic principles in terms of when we talk about equality that it's breaking down systematic or systemic injustices. Each one of us in our own unique strength possesses the power of influence to at least do something about it within our own spheres. The, in our nation, the Supreme Court ruling of Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, one of the people may recall, brought about dismantling of the systemic injustices. We too can challenge the status quo, be it in our own school boards, wherever it may be. The other aspect is to challenge stereotypes and prejudices. We face this every day. 
is advocate for equality, we should be really on the forefront of these stereotypes. We do have the potential to inspire change. Brandon Stanton, the photographer with his Humans of New, New York project, he created this platform to share diverse stories, to break down stereotypes. This is what it means to foster a culture of understanding and acceptance. There are many others. Empowering marginalized communities. Really, the economic marginalization is a huge issue. And if we go back to the Grameen Bank founded by Muhammad Yusuf, we know Muhammad Yunus, we know that you know, we too can do something to empower those who have been marginalized so that equality is, is achieved. Policy, policy change, social justice. We've been talking about the entire movement of Karbala is a movement of social justice. So in our pursuit for a more just world, we can be advocates for policy changes, again, in our own spheres, wherever we can reach, just as the recent Black Lives Matter movement has shown, the power of collective action in trying to push reform and social justice. This journey is not going to be, you know, coming to us, you know, very quickly. It, it requires perseverance, persistence in the face of adversity. Just as Imam Hussein changed the course of history, through that persistence, through that issue of sticking and standing up for a cause, as did Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and others that we have mentioned. Remember, your voice, my voice, our actions matter. We matter. And this is where we need to make sure that if we are truly being faithful to the legacy of Imam Hussain, then we must make sure that our voice matters at whatever level that we can. In the words of Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. This legacy of Imam Hussein and all those who have walked the path of justice, equality, and compassion must inspire us to follow in their footsteps. Otherwise, we'll only be paying tributes and there would be no ethical integrity to say that we praise all these people, yet we sit back and do nothing about it. With that, over to you, Dr. Astam, for some more words of wisdom. I think you rightly pointed out about the, the, the kind of uh, uh, equality that was part of the leg, uh, that is part of the legacy of Rehman uh, Hussain. There are a few questions, of course, that we should also ask in terms of equality. Three pointed questions. Uh, that uh, when he's talking about social equality, was he talking about what we call equal rights and liberties and the status, including civil rights of people? And the answer is yes. Uh, you know, when, when he was being forced to have allegiance, what was his response? Basically that, you know, I have his, I have rights to, to either accept or reject those, 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 those things. And certainly that right should be given to every individual. No one should be intimidated for that. Uh, he was talking uh, of a, a society based on freedom of expression. He was talking of a society which has equal access to certain public goods, uh, that the, the resources should not be monopolized by the power elites. And the social services should not be only confined to those people who are closer to the power elites. What was basically happening? If you look at the administrative structures of that particular time, uh, it, it, that is quite evident that uh, a kind of nepotism, a kind of a, a favoritism was being uh, committed by those people who were in the power uh, elites, uh, neglecting the people with, on the basis of their merit, neglecting people who are more capable of doing things and basically uh, having people uh, who uh, showed uh, the, 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 the loyalty to the, the, 
to the tyrant and to the despots in that particular respect. Now, it also, uh, he was also talk, talking in terms of his society, which uh, legally uh, abolishes its class and the caste system of the, 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 the tribalism, the Yes, the tribes people would identify, but based on the resources and based on the uh, legalities of the state, uh, no one would be given preference and and, and uh, over the other based on the resources of those things. And then, of course, he was talking of the absence of discrimination. Uh, oh, you know, in in the state structures also, uh, he believed. Uh, in equality before the law. And that is evident also from various of the statements that one can look into. And also, he was also uh, talking about the equality based on uh, uh, ethnicity, age, uh, and all, you know, income and property, but within the context of each. The distinction that uh, is evident also between equity and equality. So it was not only just a religious kind of fervor, but a manifestation of that religious values into the social structures of the society. He was concerned about the, the the way the society was being reconstructed, total in total opposition to what was uh, suggested by the prophet. Was, was promulgated by the prophet during his time also. That, uh, and one uh, such thing definitely one can refer to is the constitution of Medina. You know, the prophet and when he came to Medina first, he, uh, together with the, the Ansars and together with the, the, the tribes of Arabia, together with Jews and also pagans and he, 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 uh, came up with that document which we call the um, Constitution of Medina with 47 clauses in which he talks about we the people of Medina uh, give this constitution to ourselves. First, the idea of a common citizenship emerges and certainly we find that echo uh, in, in, in the words of Imam Hussain also that he is also one of the important things that we we learn from the traditions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when this constitution was being uh, written, four of the tribes of us who were Muslims, they refused to acknowledge and they refused to accept the, 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 that constitution. They rejected that constitution. They re refused to endorse it. And we did not find any action against those people by the prophet that these people should be excommunicated, should be killed, or should be basically ostracized from the uh, from the from the community, uh, and should be boycotted because they refuse to s sign the, the, that kind of treaty. Which means that the right to dissent was inherent in a society that was uh, being promulgated, and Imam Sam was also standing for that right. That you know, um, if I am not convinced that you are the right person to lead the community at this particular time, that you have committed certain acts that violate the fundamentals of the faith, then I have a right to question you and I have a right to oppose you. And I, that right has been given to me by none other than the Creator. And certainly, uh, the, the response of the tyrant was different, that uh, uh, who, who, who the hell that Creator is. I am the one who basically controls, and I'm the one who is the sh shadow of God on this earth, and I'll do whatever I want to do. And this is exactly what he did. And I think this is something that one has to realize, that when you have this kind of absolute absolutism in the, uh, in a, uh, and this kind of attitude by the powers uh, that be and the tyrants, then certainly you are not talking about Islam, you're not talking about God, you're talking about um, um, a kind of uh, philosophy where you give primacy to yourself 
over all other things. You don't care about justice. You don't care about equality. You don't care about other things. But you care primarily your own power, whether it is based on family, whether it's based on tribes, whether it's based on your own greed. And I think this is something that one has to realize that uh, the Imam Hussein's movement was a movement for social equality also. It was, uh, yes, and there were not many people who joined that social movement at that particular time, but maybe in the spirit they were with him, they did not find the courage to basically stand up and risk their lives, but he was the one who did. And that's why uh, we, we remembered that and we would continue to remember no matter what. Back to you, Dr. Walsh. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Aslam. Suffice it to say that uh, in our pursuit for this justice and equality, unless we become proactive advocates for the voiceless, then nothing will change in dismantling this system of oppression and the uh, work towards the progress of and unity. And truly, this is something that we get reminded year after year, every Muharram, we talk about the, uh, the concept of social justice, of, of equality, of all the noble attrib attributes in Karbala. Um, yet we see that once these days are over, the remembrance is over, uh, it's human nature that we go back to, back to our ways. And this is the, that level of consciousness that's required to be able to continuously believe in this, because in our quest for a just world, and, and, and this path was not easy. This path for anybody who was trying to do any changes, whatever the movement has been, was not easy. So we should not really be discouraged by the challenges that we encounter. Instead, perhaps, you know, we draw strength from the examples of the unwavering determination of Imam Hussein and many others who sought to make change and make this humanity uh, a, a, a better humanity and this world a better place to live, to make a positive difference and leave a lasting legacy for generations to come. Uh, this is, you know, really our call, you know, for, for the day. And towards the end, let us, you know, in this noble endeavor, uh, we seek Allah's help because our efforts can indeed make a profound impact. And that commitment of building a world that embodies justice and equality, wells of compassion for the better of humanity, can come through our actions. Uh, and at this point, I will ask Dr. Aslam to perhaps conclude this uh, with a dua for this session today. I think we should go beyond our words. And it's perhaps time to uh, change our attitude towards what we say. We are not saying it primarily to please ourselves or to basically make a point. We are saying it because we want to be motivated and we want others to get motivated to do things that really means some meaningful changes in the world in which we live today. So many inequalities and so many injustices and so many issues we face all over the world. And only when a group uh, determine uh, to change them, uh, adopts a value system that uh, inspires us to sacrifice and that inspires us to work together, we can definitely achieve a lot. And certainly in that respect, this is a task that cannot be done by Shias alone or by the Sunnis alone, because we are all committed to the value system of Islam. And in that value system, uh, uh, the, 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 the lines are very clear and the issues are very clear that we will not compromise the issue of injustice, on the issue of inequality, on the issue of discrimination, on the issue of denial of rights, on the issue of all those things. And I think this is something that we should work for. And in that spirit, we conclude today's uh, discussion. Inshallah, we'll be back tomorrow also with uh, uh, focusing on other issues also. Let us recite Surah Al Asr. Was blessed with Shaitan and Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal Asr inna al-insan al-fi husr illa al-dina aman wa amilu sawliha. Wa tawasu bil-haq. 
Otavaan so pissap. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the right path and inspire us to turn our words into action. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamu ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alam.